Yeah. So um, we could we could probably assume that uh, the rest of them might join us or might not be able to join us. Yeah. Right. It could be difficulty with teams too. I've experienced that too, where um, like I had meetings with my family on teams and it was just they had to download the app and you know my yeah. dad is not really technically inclined and even though that was his job before he retired he still <laughs> does not know how to do it he's forgotten everything so um yeah let's just let's just uh let's get into it and people join they can they can join us in progress we're still looking for the leash well i can't give you what i don't have okay so this is the uh Welcome everybody to the giant giant kelp restoration project in Monterey. Uh, I'm gonna. I have a few things I'd like to uh, discuss today, and they should be the next on my screen. There we go. So I think what we're gonna do today is we'll go through the PowerPoint slides. There's 87 of them, and that's gonna take about an hour. And then we'll have a question and answer period at the end of that. Maybe about 30 minutes, and that'll be the end of our session for today. The other things you'll need is a fishing license and you can get them online. It takes a little bit of uh, navigating through the thing and you have to input your information. Um, there's a little bit of confusion about the licenses. There's a go number that you can get with your fishing license and the go number is kind of your number as a California fishing license holder and it's constant for you. So if you have had a license in the past, like for abalone or something, it's the same go number. Um, and you'll just add on a new annual license uh, for fishing. It costs $52.66. I'm just going to go over that. Uh, we'll register for the g2kr.com. It takes about three minutes. It's through an online portal. And then we have an online quiz. Take you about 10 minutes to get through the quiz. And the quiz is basically on the PowerPoint slides. And then we have a waiver um, that uh, you can I'll send to you. You can download it. Just take a picture of it or you can scan it if you want to get tricky about it. Send me that that waiver and then let, we'll plan a dive um, and I'll we'll whenever you know whatever your schedule's like you're out there on a weekend or whatever and um, I'll join you and I just want to dive with you and make sure everything's cool and that'll just take let's do the one dive. So and that's kind of it and then you'll be um, certified for uh, well, not certified, but it, you'll you'll be in the program, and you'll be able to be an effective uh, member of the team here and in calling urchins out here at Tankers Reef. So, what this class is going to teach you is this is the regular PowerPoint slides, and it's uh, why this is important, why how kelp forest kelp forest became urchin barons. Talk about sea urchin behavior, their anatomy, and what the kinds of urchins are that we're going after. Uh, on the site, and then what happens during an urchin calling dive. We'll describe what that looks like and how to be effective and conservation minded urchin calling and why that's important too. And uh, the, the tanker's reef orientation. We have all this wayfinding that needs to be explained, um, you know, how it's situated out there. And then we'll talk about your dive and how you can, can, are going to conduct it. Uh, about collecting your data and reporting your data through a data portal and how about marine mammal disturbances and invasive species and how to identify those things and re how to report those things and um, how to dive on these other buoys, the orange and gray buoys and uh, some references at, at the end and tips for being safe, of course. So prerequisites, open water, you guys already have that. Yeah. Um, 20 dives in Monterey. This is like the minimum requirement. So basically, there is um, there's the class, and there's reef check divers already have an eco diver card, so they are already qualified for this kind of activity. We just gave them an update uh, for this kind of activity, an hour and a half course for the reef check divers, so they could do it. Now you guys are GUI fundamentals. You guys already are qualified to do this. We just need to show this portion of the class to you so you know what to do um, on this uh, on this particular dive. But for everybody else that is just like an open water person, they have to go through a PADI or NAWI certification uh, to be able to work on the project. And basically it's this course 
plus there's a part a part that's taught by the Patty or Nowie instructor um, about safety and and that sort of thing. And then they have they have to do two dives uh, with the instructor out on the site. So, um, but you know, different folks for different different strokes for different folks, right? I think that's how it goes. So. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's probably skilled with boat entry and exits in this group, and you can use the compass. And if you have any doubts, get supplementary training. Uh, knowledge objectives: know which are native and invasive species that threaten kelp. Be able to identify the ones relevant to this activity. Know how to cull urchins while minimizing the impact on the surrounding marine life. That's a big emphasis of this training program: is not causing other damage and to know what data you're expected to collect and how to record and uh, report it through the data portal. And recognize these plants and that are native and animal species in order to avoid harming them. I think we've kind of said that already. But uh, how to carry your hammer, I think that's uh, become a big thing uh, with trying to take your hammer and tuck it up in a way that doesn't drag on the bottom doesn't hurt yourself or swing it around and hurt other people that you're diving with and uh, they don't don't damage other things too and you know if you're entering from shore maybe you want to be careful with that in a big wave and don't, don't land on a hammer that has a pointy end on it you know things like that uh, be able to recognize these marine invasive species and the diving skills objectives are uh, planning organizing safe kelp restoration dives and you guys I'm sure you can all do that be able to identify and navigate to the location where the kelp restoration is being done. So we have all these navigation buoys that are out there on the water that you can just cruise up to either on a boat or by your scooter or whatever you want to do. And uh, it shows you the way to get to the where the work is being done. And that's by the marker buoys. And we have underwater cables and lines to direct you where to go. Uh, they're all labeled. And uh, buoyancy control is the big thing. Um, you guys already have that, but a lot of people have difficulty with their trim and for not putting their knees on the urchins and their fins on their urchins and on everything else down there. So we're trying to get people to to stay off the bottom, which is for wreck divers, that's a real challenge to do that. Um, so uh, call the urchins with a hammer and don't kill everything else that's around it. We want to make sure that we don't like, um, you know, it's, it's, you kill one thing, you know, and try to kill an urchin and then there's something behind it or there's something else that's there. You know, I, I've smashed an, uh, an urchin and then behind it was a black eye goby and it just came out belly up when I did that. The spikes hit the, the other animal. So you, you just got to be careful about that part and um, be safe, right? That's the number one goal in all this is that, you know, I, I initially saw what was going on on the North Coast and the way that they were conducting their dives up there and it just seemed like a real dangerous activity. People were just learning how to dive and were coming out and they were landing on the rocks and getting the lifeguards and pulling them off and it just became a kind of a disaster and it just it became a lesson learned that you know we need to be able to do this in a safe way even though divers can do it you know and everyone thinks they can do it but it's it's it has to be done in a safe way and um, you know that's the, the number one goal in all of this and then we have the data portal too and we'll show you how to use that but and it and talks about the calling location and oh and so for counting urchins it's like the reef check divers and people that are like science divers they're, they like to count things i like to count things too but counting urchins is kind of a pain it's kind of like you'd rather just smash them and not really have to count them you know because it's just like you know um it's just more things to keep track of mentally. You just want to kind of enjoy it and and take care of your buddy and stuff and not be counting as you go. Um, and counting two things with two different urchins is even harder. And then you have to keep track of it on tally. But some people will do that, and that's good because those people that do it, um, we can use their information to act as a subsample for everybody else. So um, if you're worried about counting urchins, don't because you're not going to have to. All we want you to do is you were down there for so long smashing urchins and then we'll just figure out what that means in terms of how many urchins you would someone normally calls in a minute right we'll just calculate it that way 
So why is this important, right? So I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys have all heard this already, that the kelp forests are just really in decline right now. And in a kelp forest, there's, you know, a thousand species of different life is in a kelp forest, and um, including fish and sea otters and, um, you know, all these other animals that are in there. And this is really a biodiversity crisis when the urchins have um, come up and eaten all their food and this kelp forest goes away, right? Um, and it's a kelp forest hosts the most diverse biological communities in California. You know, that's track. And this is a little video. I don't know if you can see this video that was made by um, Ian Markham here. Um, it looks really clear on my screen, but I don't know how it's coming across. It might be kind of chunky on yours. Um, and then this is an urchin population explosion. And it started in 2014 and 2016. We have a lot of marine heat. The warm water blob just uh, sat off the, the coast and just heated us up. And the kelp did very poorly. The kelp likes really cold water. And um, it wasn't cold. And the urchins didn't seem to mind it. Our urchins can survive up to 75 degree water. And so they, they did really well in all this. And their numbers went up 500 times what they were before. And we lost the sea stars in that in that marine heat wave. There were all these large uh, Pycnopodia, the sunflower star. It was a big urchin predator. And they were gone along with 22 other species um, that were devastated by um, by the marine heat and by that 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 sea star wasting disease that was kind of happened all at once on the entire north coast during the heat wave. And so we're still recovering for that. Um, the sea star wasting disease is still present. We still see sea stars that are turning to goo. So we have a loss of predators is another factor in this. And, um, you know, a lot of the parts of Monterey look like this, right? So does anyone know where, where this was filmed? Where do you, where do you think this was filmed in Monterey? Coral Street. Coral Street. That's it. Good answer, not the right answer, but it's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Point Lobos. That's Middle Reef uh, at Point Lobos. Yeah. I was gonna say that looks like the back part of uh, Middle Reef. We saw at Tolga and I saw that a couple weeks ago. Just tons of yeah. urchins. There's tons of urchins on that big plateau over there at Middle Reef, and it goes down to like 55 feet, and then really becomes urchins down there, and goes all the way around to Bluefish Cove and um, Cannery Row Wall is just destroyed by urchins and it just it breaks your heart to see it you know that to go like that when and kelp becomes like this you know the, the kelp just doesn't have a chance you know they they get onto that hold fast and they just burrow in and undermine the hold fast and then the whole thing ends up on the shore um so our state and federal agencies are monitoring our activities. So the um, this is an exception to recreational fishing rules, but the um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the California Ocean Protection Council, both are state agencies, and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary slash NOAA, are, uh, fed, that's the federal agency, and they're monitoring what we're doing. So they've gone out there and they've done all their surveying ahead of time. They've counted all the urchins and all the kelp on our site, and they're going to be watching if we cause other disturbances to the environment. They're actually going to, they, they already done it. They went and took pictures of certain spots. I don't know where they are, and but there's a grid and stuff, and they take a picture, and then they'll come back later on and take another picture, and then they'll compare the two images to see, oh, well, a diver might have done this kind of thing. So um, we really have to be very overly careful in doing this that we don't um that because we're really being watched and the the success of the project is not up to me it's up to them um in determining whether we are successful in doing this or not so success means removing the urchins without impacting the other life so that's very true um about an urchin right so Urchins are, are, have five-part radial symmetry, like you can see in this diagram here, how an urchin is, has like these five sections. So they're in the same family as sea stars, right? They will also have the five-part radial symmetry. It's like, I don't know, you call it spokes on a wheel, but um, 
some 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 sea stars have six and seven sometimes, but um, urchins are all this five part thing. So they're in the same family as um, sea stars, as sand dollars, um, brittle stars are in that same family. Uh, sea cucumbers are also in that same family as well. And this is what an urchin looks like on the inside, right? So it has these um, the row, the, the reproductive organs, the gonads uh, that are inside of it, and it uh, that is like its fatty tissues, right? So as the urchin um, is brought along, it it is on the reef. It's, if it's eating a lot of kelp, it'll be healthy like that, right? But if the the urchins are deprived of the resource of algae, they will like consume their own gonad to stay alive, right? And let me go back. So th this is what it looks like on the inside of an urchin, right? And so when you smash them, you want to try and damage it so much that it can't like reproduce, right? Like. And and you'll see that the urchins out there don't have full gonads because they've exhausted their their food resource for the most part, and so the the gonad is very minimal. Um, but you don't want to like like give it a single hole in it because then like its last dying gasp is going to be to try and spawn, right? So you want to make sure and like really damage it so that it's not going to have that chance, even though without much gonad, there's not much potential, but there's enough of them right that they might do something so um urchin spines right urchins have these spines on them and um, that's their defense from the predators is these spines and it when they're actually when they're walking out on the sand they actually lower their spines and put their little they have these little tube uh well it's saying here that they're pretty sharp uh and here they're like a pencil point okay i mean you can pick them up with your hands and they're not gonna with your bare hands they're not gonna pierce your hands but um, if you really hit it hard, it'll go through your skin. And then it has like the spine will like embed itself in your skin and, and you pull it out, like pieces of it will break off inside. So um, you, and there, you, you, you see people that have, have urchins, like they've been poked by urchins and then like weeks later, they still have evidence of it in them. So um, don't try to get it. I, I've, I've hit them hard enough with my fins to actually have spines that pierce my fins right so they're kind of durable so you just kind of want to be careful of that and don't be careless with them kind of be like you can grab them with it you know but don't don't impact them don't hit them with your hand or something um and it says here you can see this article i should probably look at that article i don't know, I don't know what it says and then urchin tube feet right so in addition to all the spines they have like like starfish have these little tube feet and they can kind of smell with these little tube feet um there are little suction cups on them. That's what makes them stick to the to the reef is these little suction cup uh, feet, and they walk around that way, and they, that's how they move in different directions. Um, they kind of smell other things. You can see the pedal area. They, they, those are the ones on top. That are, that's the little tubes that go out, and they're really long. They're actually twice as long as the spines, and they're going out and they're trying to like sense things in their environment, and uh, they can sense each other, and they can smell where food is, and are attracted to it that way. And the other thing they like to do is they put things on top of their heads, right? They're kind of like they find a shell or or a big rock or something, and they just like put it on top, and then it makes them feel like they're safe or something, you know? That and it kind of it kind of works because when you're kind of looking scanning, you don't really notice that there's an urchin there because it's it's it has it's it's hiding in plain sight by this this camouflage that it's picked up. You know, I was going through on the reef and there was one the rock was was very lightweight because it's uh it doesn't weigh much but it was probably a big rock you know like six inches high like that and, was, and this little urchin was supporting it he was like going around with this big rock on top and i just went over there and just picked it up and went boom <laughs> that, that was the end of that but yeah you, you, need, you need to kind of look past that camouflage and find them underneath it and um so generally, the urchins have changed their behavior because before we had one urchin, one purple urchin, and, and for every 25 square meters, right? They were hiding in cracks. They're way out of the way. And but then when you get to a certain number of them, and there's no longer drift algae that comes in to to feed them, 
then they have to come out of their cracks and and eat um, and openly graze on the surface for other things. And the otters really won't eat the urchins. Everyone likes to think that, oh, well, the you know, that's part of the solution is the otters. But otters will help to maintain a kelp forest that has healthy urchins in them, but they will not eat the urchins in the barren. They, they are, they're clever. They, they figure that, that those things have no value because there's no gonad in them, and they, they won't bother with them. They might give it to a pup to play with, but the mothers aren't going to bother with them. And the otter needs to eat a lot of them because they have to eat 25% of their body weight every day. And so they just kind of roam in the ocean, uh, roam, roam in the open, and they're devouring kelp wherever they find it. And um, they create these urchin barons. And so when you get an urchin baron, they've eaten all the kelp, and they kind of eat like in a certain order, right? Like a goat will do that too. It'll eat these things and those things and those things. So they eat the brown algaes first, and they eat the red algaes next, and then they, they go on to eating the crustose coralline algae. That's that pink bubblegum stuff that's all over the rocks and the red encrusting algaes. They eat those last. So what ends up happening is you see like the urchin barons the way they are, where it's just like a purple and purple spotted and with the pink moonscape, right? With all the purple urchins on it. That's kind of how it ends up. Um, so this is what a healthy urchin would look like on the inside. You've seen this picture before. And it's from a healthy kelp forest so it's full of that that gonad but this is when it's uh, starving on the reef is what it looks like right so this urchin hasn't been eaten for a while and you can see the gonad is all gone on the urchin and what you'll what you see is just the remainder the other tissues inside of it when you cut it open this is the mouth of the urchin they call it the aristotle's lantern uh, it's an odd name for it but it has these uh five jaws that kind of meet in one thing, they're self-sharpening. It's kind of neat. Uh, and they, uh, yeah, this, they're just de devoid of, of any gonad in, inside of them. And it, it's to varying degrees. And also, it's a good point, is that they can live in this starving state for years. Uh, they, they're not gonna, you're not going to outlast them by starving them. Once they've exhausted their resource, they'll just sit there and wait for more kelp to form in the spring, and they'll eat that. You know, they can live without eating for years. So they can actually eat by di um, dissolved solids in, that are from the ocean. So, um, you know, there's been urchin barons have lasted for 50, 70 years. You can go for a long time. Uh, so there's two kinds of urchins that are in this range, and we have permission to uh, cull both of them. Um, where is it? So purple urchins, right, that's the... Stranglocentris franciscanus, and um, they are uh, kind of a light lavender. This is kind of a bluish color in this picture, but they're, they're kind of a lavender color is kind of my impression of it, the dark purple. Um, they're usually in really high numbers. They're, they're, sometimes there's so many of them that they're touching each other. They're on top of each other uh, as they come together, and uh, they aggregate. And the other one is the red urchin. Uh, Mesocentris franciscanus, and um, red urchins come in different colors. Red urchins can be like kind of a pink color, and they can be like a black color, right? Um, color is not a really good indicator for the red urchins. Um, they have a red body, but the, basically the the it, it has a huge range of colors. So it could be a very pale pink to a very like a very dark a black is their color. But you can see the difference is the the length of the spines. Their, their spines are about the same length as the size of their body, right? That's a good way to, to know the two, between the two species. But you don't have to really discern them too much because like we have permission to kill both. So um, the body is always red. So if you, you put a light on them, you can see that it's red, but it's uh, maybe a dark red. And uh, some of them have lived for, they, they did a carbon dating. One was like 240 years old. Um, yeah, they go a really long time. There's, um, I, I was, I was diving at Half Moon Bay, which is kind of a weird place because there's no otters there and, um, it's illegal to harvest abalone and urchins there. And the urchins were the size of basketballs. They were so huge. They were just like, I was just amazed at how big the red urchins were there. And, um, you know, it, it comes in different ways. Sometimes you'll see all purples. Sometimes you go to a place and it's all reds. 
you know, it really kind of varies quite a bit. Um, usually there's there's more purples and reds, you know, our ratio was about seven to one, you know, some places are two to one, it just kind of varies and it depends on lots of factors, including if there's a, a red urchin fishery that is active and, and um, harvesting just one species or the other. So the goal is to preserve biodiversity. So if an urchin is sitting there on the bare rock, like in this picture right here, so you want to try and preserve it by, if it's over the bare rock or sand um, within, or with encrusting pink or red algae, then you just go ahead and get it where it is, right there on this part. So um, this is the hammer that we're using for the project. It looks like, here, here's, a, here's what one looks like here. So I have I have one. Just, you can see like a life size of me in the picture, right? So it's a uh, it's basically a, a welding hammer, right? This is what you use for um, if you were doing some welding and you wanted to knock the slag off it. You kind of like hit it with this, and that that way your hand won't get hot from all the hot metal you're hitting. And um, but this spring is useful too because it kind of gives your arm some some relief, you know, from getting because. You're hitting rocks, you know, and you're kind of bang, 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 bang. And you do that for an hour and, you know, your arm gets pretty tired. Um, I and switch to right to left kind of thing as I go along. So, uh, so call the urchins only over the bare rock or the rock coated with uh, the pink or encrusting red algae. Um, so this, that's the hammer, the pointed end and a chisel end. Um, sometimes... I think what 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 we've discovered is that like if you try to use a hammer that is like a flat, you know, like it has like a ball peen hammer or something like a like a regular uh, claw hammer that you might have at home, um, if, when you hit it, it is a pressure wave that's right in front of the, uh, the the face of the hammer, and as you go to hit it, the urchin will just squirt out of the way as you go to hit it. So you really want to have a, a chiseled end or a pointy end, and like for the, I find that for like a small urchin, like urchin can be like that big, then I use a little guy. And there's like, you, on Tanker's Reef, you'll see there's a lot of the urchins live in these little holes. Uh, they have, over time, they have burrowed themselves into holes on the rock. And this tool works just good for that. You just go pop them in there. Uh, if they're bigger and they're in a big hole, sometimes they're in a large, like a little pocket and they've, the urchins have ground their way back and forth over the years, you know, and then a new one comes in that place, but, but they've all, they, it, they then you just use the chisel and you just get it. And I kind of like rip them, you know, I kind of like hit it and pull it out. Um, after, after a thousand, so this is an example of it right here, this video of, of what that looks like underwater. For smashing an urchin. So you just get it here and just hit it with the hammer with the chisel, break it in half like that. That seems like a lot of hits, but that's kind of the idea. So um, effective urchin calling. So uh, you want to crush it so they don't, it, it can't reproduce, right? It's basically the, the premise of it. Um, so if you make a single hole in the top of the shell, it's not enough. It needs to be something larger than that that is you've really damaged the urchin because if you just put a single hole in it it's still going to live for a few days i'd say like like if you if you would make a hole that like a one inch hole in the top of it or like or like a hole like that it's probably gonna live for a few days and uh it'll crawl around whatever it might decide to if it can it's going to try to reproduce with its last gasp at that point so you want to want to break it up. So this is what it, it's like when you when you break up an urchin like that. You make a big hole in the top, and you've you've really done some damage to it. And it's it's not going to live very long after that. But it'll still move. You know, I I didn't realize how long it takes for them to die. They're they're such durable and incredible creatures that even in this state, it'll probably move a couple inches and then not move anymore and live for like three days in that state. I've actually cut them in half and both halves will live for about a day and a half. So uh, pretty incredible creatures. And, you know, we want to try and put them out of their misery. And, uh, you know, there's five parts to them. So you want to try to break it up and, and damage all the parts. But yeah, they, they, yeah, let's, let's just try it like that. And um, you don't need to squeeze it, you know. Um, if you squeeze it, then you're going to hurt your fingers. But sometimes they're really small. Like a like a like a one centimeter urchin, and you can just they're not it, it's like a they have shells, but they're the purple urchin shells are not very hard. You can just kind of they're kind of brittle, 
like an egg or something. The red urchins are they're thicker shells. They're more durable. Especially a big red urchin. I mean, your hammer will bounce off them. They're they're pretty tough. Um, I'm over here. Why do I want to go? There we go. Uh, saying small urchins take a couple taps to call them. You can always hit them a couple times. The, the other thing you're kind of looking for too is to um, make it make a big enough hit with your hammer that you know you've killed it, right? You don't want to like come back and try to hit it again because you weren't sure if you killed it already, right? So as you're calling urchins, you'll find that, you know, you try to do it in an orderly way, but it's really kind of random, you know? You're kind of, maybe I'm going to go this way or that way, but you're kind of like getting a lot of stuff and you might miss one and you want to go back and get them. And so if you make a big enough impact in them and big hole in them, then you can tell where you've been. And then your buddy knows where you've been too, right? Because your buddy not be really paying attention and he may come over into your lane a little bit and try to smash them and they won't know because you only been a single hole in the top it's not obvious so you want to make that's another reason why you want to make a pretty big uh impact on them but you also don't want to chip the rock substrate too because and a tanker's reef it's the shale is very brittle so you'll find that rot right away is that if you start using your chipping hammer and you start pounding on the rock you're just going to break off pieces of rock um, it, it's a mudstone basically that whole area was a river at one point and it's sedimentary stone and it it lifts it's in layers and there's like these undercuts underneath there where there's fish in there and stuff and there's other other animals in these layers and the stone is very it's very friable very brittle and so you want to be be aware of that and don't try to cause too much damage to to that uh, shell environment by hitting it with the hammer but you can you can smash the urchin and not smash what's underneath it uh and then all the culling stuff that is that is from the urchin it all goes back right into the ecosystem and it's consumed by fish and other like black eyed go as you're doing it you'll see black eyed gobies come up you'll see those little sand dabs will come up on the rocks and they'll start eating it you'll see fish coming in from all over and you know we did this experiment in pacific grove and our our fish biomass increased 16 times uh due to our culling it just it, it's it's food is what it is no, this, none of it's wasted. And uh, we're going to try to restore the biodiversity that was lost when they took over the reef. There's about seven urchins per square meter on this reef right now. Or historically, there was 0 0.04. <laughs> so that's a huge increase. And uh, we want to lower that down uh, quite a bit. So uh, these urchins are on a rock with only encrusting algae. They can call them right where they are right that's an easy one right there they're in the open i'm not sure where this was taken uh here's some red urchins that are uh on a rock with the the purple with the the bubble gum encrusting uh coralline algae and there's also a red algae there that's the red encrusting algae it's like a film on the rock and so you're really not going to damage that so you can just get them right where they are um and in this note there are dark light and red urchins so there's a pink ones here you can kind of see a variety it's a pink one here there's a real dark one here in this picture and uh, here's a couple of purples in here as well but that's kind of the color range is well represented in this picture and you can see these here the, these ones are on the sand so if urchins on the sand just go ahead and get it right there where it is um and you'll that way nothing will get damaged and but you know it's, it's kind of difficult you know, it, it's it's better. It, to me, it's easier to have a hard background than a soft. You know, when you're trying to smash something, it kind of sand kind of absorbs the impact rather than the rock. You know, rock rock is better for it, but you can get them on the sand as well. And um, so, if if this if the urchin's in a crack, you know, these these aren't in very deep cracks, but I think it kind of makes the point that if an urchin is way down in a crack, um, it's a happy urchin. Right, it's getting its kelp, it's getting it without going out and openly grazing and looking for more. You can leave it alone, right, and not have to go in there and get it. You know, if it's this is even seems a little shallow, you know, I might just take my hammer and kind of pop it out of the hole and smash it on on this on the side a little bit. But if it's deep in a crack, you know, if you start swinging your hammer in there, you're gonna kill everything in that crack, right? So 
there's there's no there's not any real point in digging deep for urchins. You just leave them where they are, and then if they come out and exhibit bad behavior, then another group of divers can get them on a second pass. Right. We're going to go over the same area several times, so um, the idea is not to to damage the, the wildlife. This is kind of a good example of what it's like out there at Tankers Reef. There's all these layers, right? With sedimentary layers with interstitial like sands. Like it was like it built up over the years, and then it was sand, and then it built up over the years, you know, and then it becomes like these layers, these lifts, you know. And sometimes the lifts are, you know, four feet high. You know, I'm sure you've all been to Shale Island and seen what that's like. It's the same kind of environment as Shale Island where you have these little shelves in there full of nudibranchs uh, that are down in those holes. So you're, you're kind of, when you're, the urchins like it, those spots. That's a good place for them to kind of hide and hunker down. And so you'll see them out, you see them a lot of times in these little holes. So you want to be able to kill them in these little cracks, but not kill everything else around them, kill all the Corianactus and, and the sponges and everything else that are around this, this area. So if it's deep under a ledge, yeah, we really don't want anyone like, like crawling under the ledge and trying to get them deep in there. You know, take off your tank and go, go deep. You know, uh, you know, uh, just leave them if they're deep, and that's that's fine. Um, I find like purples are on top, kind of. They kind of like in about like March, I would say. No, I, I guess it was April. All the the purples just decided it was time, and they all came out of the cracks and started running over the reef. They just like it's spring, you know, and so the purples are out on top and on top of the reef a lot of times or in or in the cracks. But the reds, the big red urchins are like deep underneath these cracks. Um, they have different behaviors. You know, the, the red urchins are more mobile. They're bigger. They go faster. They have to they have to eat in order to live. You know, they will they can starve to death. The purple urchins will not. Right. But um, but a, a red urchin will also eat a lot more than a purple urchin, much more detrimental to kelp growth than a purple urchin. But there's less of them, too. There was only five percent red on the reef. Right. Just give you some idea of the balance of, of purples and reds. So if you can't see the hammer tip, probably means you shouldn't be swinging a hammer at it. Right. So you want to be able to see all the way in there what you're looking at. Don't like blindly, you know, try to be, you know, calling a. You know, it's it's over here somewhere. I can't see on the other side of that ledge, so I'm just going to try and maybe it's there somewhere. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to come over here and, oh, OK, I'm getting it. You know, getting all those urchins uh, on those cracks. That's the technique. And I told you that, well, you know what? I need the keyboard. I do. OK, there we go. Uh, we'll. We'll get the urchins out without damaging other marine life eventually. So, not to worry. We're going to do several passes on these on these areas. You know, uh, it's not like you 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 paint a wall with one brush stroke, right? <laughs> it's going to take a little bit. Um, so, some of the ones that are neat, we'll leave those urchins alone. It says here over here, and um, these ones here could probably be moved out of the way and then smashed in another spot. So, these ones here are close to a. Uh, fish eating an enemy. Um, so move these out of the way before you smash these so we don't damage the anemone in this situation. And then this is an uh, about neutral buoyancy and body position. So uh, this diver here is doing pretty good uh, staying up off the bottom. Fins are up and the only thing touching uh, the the reef is the hammer and a hand for grabbing urchins. Um, sometimes I'll put a knife in my other hand and pop them out of little spots and get them with the other one. Um, but that's but that's the good body position, kind of trimmed out like that, which you guys do all the time, anyways. Not like us. We're like, it's different, you know. Like this is this is okay. You should have your gauges up. You should have everything up on top of you. Not dragging stuff on the bottom. You know, not hooking, not scratching your your gauges and stuff. Which for me is kind of difficult because I I go a lot closer to the bottom than most people are comfortable with because I'm doing reef check, right? Like, like, like reef check divers are like crawling around on the reef. You know, we're like take all the air out of my BC. I'm just going to crawl around and do my stuff. But we have to kind of not do that now because there's full of urchins. We don't want to cause all this bycatch. So um, 
somewhere you have to be, be between not the, the usual five feet off the bottom where we're cruising along and get down closer to where you're within arm's distance of, of the reef. And this is how you wouldn't do it. This is how you're when you're on, you just take all the air out, like I was just saying, and you're like down on the reef, and your knees are on the reef, and um, you're gonna probably pop your dry suit doing something like that. Um, dry suits are an infinite point, uh, have infinite points of failure. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I've been diving with the, with the wetsuit uh, for all my urchin diving, just for that reason, because it's like, I just can't deal with all the, uh, I'm gonna get, spikes and uh, spines in all of my uh, gear. So uh, give you guys. So, uh, so here's a camouflage crab, right? That's on something here. And so there's little critters, you know, this is kind of a pointing out um, on the, about the diversity, biodiversity of what's in the kelp forest and even in these places. And this was shot out at Tanker's Reef and these things are there. Um, so we're trying to protect these creatures like this. There's all these shale boring clams out there, too. I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this site, but there's been over the years, these clams have come and they they're, they bore clam. They bore their shells deep into the rock. And that this is the surface. You'll see there's an in-current and an ex-current opening uh, siphons here. And I've been trying to figure about, out what those are for weeks. I saw one. I saw one there, and I could not figure out what it was. Yeah, yeah, they're really bizarre looking, and there's actually a couple different species there. Um, but there, that goes down into the rock about a foot. It goes way wow. down inside it, and then when I they it was some are kind of giant tunicate. Yeah, it's kind of like a tunicate, right? Because tunicates have the two openings too, but they're clams. And um, when the clam dies off, you'll find fish in those holes. Um, we've hmm. been finding a lot of uh, fringe heads. Uh, sarcastic fringe heads, particular, uh, which is kind of, I, I see them around the wharf a lot, but there are a lot of them out here and they live in those holes. So if you see a good hole, put a light in there, you might see a fish looking back at you. Um, here's a, a couple of dorids, well, three dorids. It's like a, a door door, and they're making, laying eggs, right? So we want to avoid damaging those nudibranch eggs. Um, this, this place is really rich with nudibranchs too, lots of different kinds. Uh, we get San Diego Doras. We see the shaggy mouse out here, which is actually kind of cool looking. It has like little hairs on it. It looks like a little mouse. You'll see them. They're cool. Um, it's like a little worm here, some annelid. Here's some sponges. Here's a leafy horn mouth. This is bryzoan. There's all kinds of life down here that we want to really be sensitive of. Um, here's the little sculpins too. It, it seems like in all of the urchin barren stuff, it's seems like the rise of sculpins and I don't really know if that's true or not, but I certainly see them a lot more, you know, they're a lot more um, because maybe there's less places for them to hide that you'll see a lot more sculpins uh, out, out on the site jumping. You don't really see them because they're so camouflage, but they jump from place to place and that's when you'll see them. And the yellow spot fringe head is like that too. Like once you start culling them, they'll all come out. They'll come to see what you're doing and try to eat the food. So um, be really aware of that, that there's going to be some critters jumping around uh, while you're doing this work. So uh, here's a picture of, of of smashing urchins. It's not really close in the picture, but um, what you can see is this is all colonial sand tube worms right here. These are all um, worms, right? Worm, worm casings in these shells. So if you're just smashing them on top of, this colonial sand tube worm, you're going to damage the colonial sand tube worm by doing that. In this case, you want to pick it up and, you know, put it, put it on some rock or something and, and smash it over there. So, uh, okay. That's it for anatomy and everything else. Good. So, uh, this is Tanker's Reef. So Tanker's Reef is this area that, um, is as you come into Monterey, normally you come in on, on highway one and you get off here at, um, this is Del Monte right here. So there's that, oh, that long off ramp. And then you come down into town, this is Casa Verde, Aquarius dive shops over here. And then you can coming down, there's, you go through the Navy area, all eucalyptus trees. And then there's some condos over here. There's a parking lot right here at Park Avenue. And then you keep coming down and you'll see uh, there's all the grassy area. They call it window on the bay sometime. There'll be protesters out there different times standing in the parking lot. And then there's another parking lot here. It says it's, uh, it's like Del Monte parking lot, I think is what it's called. 
and um, the uh, Monterey Bay kayaks is right next to it. I'm not sure you recognize that. And then you'll you would keep coming in, and then there's the municipal wharf right here, municipal marina, the wharf number two. Uh, I think Josh and Nick started from here and went this way down the coast. Uh, they were able to start at this point. Um, yeah, we started uh, right by wharf two and scootered over from there, but right yeah, here, could, yeah, yeah, it probably would have been better to park closer to Tanker Reef and yeah, you park here or here is closest. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll show you more about these spots here. There's another one over here at, at Casa Verde Way, but that's kind of even farther to get to the site. Um, this red line here is the boundary that's established by Fish and Wildlife in the regulations. So we're only allowed to cull urchins in this one place, right? Not on the MPAs, not at San Carlos Beach. It all has to be done right inside this Tankers Reef project area. And like I said, it's, you look at just looking at the bathymetry, you can see that this is all shale in here. This is all like this substrate that is like from this used to be like this little lake over here at the Navy that used to reach the ocean before. And it formed like a, a little channel right here. There's a sand channel right through the middle of this site that divides it in half. Right. I'm going to show you a little more. So uh, as a shale reef, this is granite over here, right? So shale, granite. And we want to be able to, in the future, go to granite, right? Like this is not the best site for doing kelp restoration because like, sometimes there's kelp there, sometimes there's not. And so, and, and the, but that stone too, by its nature of being mudstone, it's like, um ablative right like layers are always coming off it's always sloughing off material as it sits there so it's, it's hard for kelp to really stick to that thing if it's always you know slippery and moving off its own stuff so granite structures are much more harder and more res and better for kelp and i think that's why here at tankers some years we have kelp sometimes we don't but we always had kelp at the granite structures at the breakwater in san carlos so I'll talk more about that later. So, uh, so okay. So, this area right here is the cable grid, and I'll talk more about the cable grid. So, um, that's kind of where it's located. It's it's about 700 feet from shore. It's kind of in the middle of our treatment area. Our treatment area is going to be this half of the reef, and this area is the is the um, the control area. Right, so we were not going to call anything on that on this side of the sand channel, and what they did, our, our agency partners, is they came over here and counted everything on the cable grid. They counted all the urchins and the kelp in this spot, and then they also picked a random spot over here in the control area and did the same thing, counted everything. Right, so um, we have a little. They're not exactly the same. It's not exactly a parody. But we want to make sure that we only call on this side so we can see the effects. We don't want anyone to call over there because that would just not be helpful to do that because then it would be like, well, they, they both got kelp. Well, they shouldn't have, <laughs> but somebody went over there and killed all the urchins in the, in the control. So we're definitely concentrating in this area on, on this side of the reef. Uh, also, too, about these areas, this is where the restrooms are. So there's restrooms here at the wharf. Also at Casa Verde, uh, they have porta potties they, they set up over there. Okay. Uh, act as a quality control. Okay, talked about that. So this is the, what the grid looks like, right? So it's basically bolted to the bottom. There are these uh, like five inch long stainless steel bolts that are epoxied into the that shale bed. And on them, they have, uh, the whole thing is pretty flat, right? So this sends 27 feet and this sends 32 feet. Right, give you kind of a lay of the land. Um, on lo this is a leaded line, and so is the one on the south side. It has it's basically a, a polypropylene line. It has a lead little lead pellets inside of it, and on that line, there's little tags, right, that tell you what what lane you're in. So basically, it establishes 20 of these five meter wide lanes that go in the north south direction, and the tapes. Are going to start at the zero mark and go to a hundred, right? So what I mean by that is that in this drawing, this this outside line out here is actually a closed line, 
that's that's uh, like a plastic coated clothesline it's been tied together on bolts and then this orange line right here is actually like a cave line like you'd use for if you were diving in a cave right it's like a string and it's bolted to the bottom too so between the clothesline and the cave line is 10 meters right 10 meters is about 30 feet a little more than 30 feet wide right and then in the middle of that lane right be between the a point and the other a point is a 100 meter tape measure 100 meters is 330 feet right it's a long ways right but the it the on the north end is where it's tied off at first so that's zero and then the line is pulled all the way to the other end and it has another wire attaching it to the other tag at the end of the a over here and those tape measures are down there right now right i just set them down there and they're just gonna weather the weather right and hang out and uh, they might be a little this is all drawn really straight but in reality it's not really straight right it's kind of it's in the water right so the idea is, and i'll show you how this is done but this is kind of the lay of the land and every, every corner has a yellow buoy on it and the, the the corners are labeled too: northwest southwest southeast south, northeast and it's laid on a magnetic heading right so there's no point in going true and try to adjust it right for for a declination we're just going to use we're divers we're going to go with compass that's how it's laid out right so that's that's the, the grid there and we also have a mooring ball on it that is um, this is seven meters off the north end, right? And that's what uh, that's what uh, Maxwell and Nick were dove on last weekend. They went, they started on the white buoy, went to the bottom, came down here. I put a bunch of hammers here. I put about a half a dozen hammers sitting attached to the reef here, and that's where I met up with them. Was right right at this point, and then I wandered around and killed a bunch of urchins on on the kelp over here. Um, there's also an orange buoy. Right. So the orange buoy is a different kind of a different idea. And I'll explain more about that. But basically, um, it's a single buoy. It has an anchor on it and a lot of chain. It shows like a little ball, but it's actually a chain. And then it has a uh, reel, a hundred meter reel that is going south from it. Right. And that just just I'll talk more about how that is. And there's a gray buoy, too, that does the same thing. But this is for our train divers to use. And the, the gray one is for untrained divers to use. So if somebody were to casually like come to town and they're like, hey, I'm just visiting. I just want to go out and smash some merchants. Um, I'll buy a license for the day, whatever. Where can we go? And we want their data so uh, they can go to the gray buoy. Like if you were to come in like on the charter boat on the beach hopper on a weekend and say, you know, we're going to go out and do this. You can go down there. Uh, there'll be some hammers at the bottom and uh, go have a good time and smash a bunch of urchins and report your data. But it's a simpler process for them because, you know, they're not trained or anything and they don't know what to do. And so the gray buoy is going to be where it's high density urchin targets, right? Not sensitive kelp in you know, other species <laughs> environments. Like the worst areas is where we'll put the gray buoy and uh, we'll let them uh, concentrate on the, the, reducing the high density urchin patches. So. Um, I just kind of explained all that. Oh, it's a three-year project. Okay. Um, so we want people, there's a couple ways to get there. I'm going to explain all the ways that, how you can get to this site. So you can start at the dock, right? If you have a commercial, your own boat or a commercial boat, you can start here or you can start at the breakwater and come on out this way and approach the grid uh, from the north. We want everyone to approach from the north all the time. Um, that way, because the divers are going to be on the south side, and so if we have everybody come, all their boats come in from the north side, maybe we can eliminate this, you know, we're putting divers and boats in the same place, right? We want to try and make it safe. How can we do that? Have them always come in from the north and leave to the north, and that way they won't cut all the kelp up too with their props, and all of our divers will be on the south side, either going to shore or returning back uh, safely to a buoy. So we're telling people go from the north and moor at the white buoy. That's the one that, that you guys were on the other day. That's the one you can moor on. The other ones you shouldn't moor on because those are are just anchors and chains there. The, the mooring ball has got a huge block on the bottom of it. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, oh, tell everybody too, the wind comes up at one o'clock usually. So it's best to be all done by one. Um, it's best if you can get there kind of early, if you're going to do two dives, you know, come at eight and then do a second one and be 
be off the water by one probably is probably the best approach um, to get it out there. It starts to pick up a lot of wind shop. And here's the other way you can go. It's 0.8 miles from the breakwater to get out there by private boat. Um, and then you could also do it by kayak too. Uh, um, Monterey Bay kayaks there, they, they rent kayaks. Um, and you can always launch from there as well. We're trying to get a discount with them. I haven't figured that out yet. I got to talk to them. Um, but you can park right next to that parking lot. You can go out by kayak. It's a very short ride. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, if you were out there on a kayak and the wind were to shift and instead of blowing the usual northwest, if it changes 90 degrees and starts blowing over the peninsula, like an offshore breeze, you need to get back to shore right away because it, it'll pick up sometimes and then you won't be able to get your kayak back to shore. Um, it'll just blow too hard and you'll end up in Moss Landing. Um, this is uh, our preferred parking place right here is at this place that's off Park Avenue, uh, just off of Del Monte Avenue is a little. This is what it looks like from a different view. So here's Park Avenue right here. Um, it says two hour parking, but I don't know if that's really enforced. There's a anytime uh, American Lock and Key is sitting over there. They've been there for a week. And I don't know. No one they, doesn't seem to bother them. Uh, there's a Rotor Rooter parking lot that's abandoned right here, but they said they're going to take it again. I'm still trying to negotiate with them. But anyways, you can park right here and then you just kind of walk down the wreck trail a little bit. And then there's an entrance over a little uh, a slight sand dune. And then you walk down the beach a little bit and then you go out to the grid. But the orange buoy is sitting over here, so maybe you don't have to walk as far if you're going to the orange buoy. Because things are going to move around, like the orange buoy and the gray buoy are going to move around. So, um, you know, your distance may vary. Um, so this is some explanation of that. Um, and it, or you could just cut the angle, right? Go at an angle. Don't don't do so much walking on the beach. I mean, it's hard packed sand, but you're carrying a lot of gear. So um, try to minimize that if you can. Um, walk to the beach. Yeah, it says two hour parking, but I don't, I don't know. No restrictions on weekends. So I guess weekends are good. So this is equipment you'll need to go out there. You need a fishing license for sure. It's $52.66 for a year. Uh, and you can get it at this address. I'll, I'll share all the links with you at the end. You don't have to write them down right now. Um, buy a hammer. Uh, it costs eight dollars and six cents for that Amazon hammer I was showing you. Um, there's Home Depot sells it for six dollars and twenty seven cents. Uh, there's another one I found. Harbor Freight sells one for six dollars. Uh, and and I'm going to leave some out there on the buoys, too. Right. So, uh, you know, you can buy your own hammer and bring it with you. That way, you know, for sure you're, you're going to have one and uh, you don't at the end of your work, you don't have to return it. You know, but you, if in a pinch, you can always borrow one of mine down there. Just try to return it back where you found it. Um, and um, I think they're all sold out. I, every time I go to Home Depot, I like buy all their hammers. And so <laughs> I might be, <laughs> I may be defeating the purpose, but you can, you can order them online too. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll send it to your house. Uh, and a small slate would be good too, because you're going to need to know what your assignment is, what you're going to. So you have to write that down and you want to note your ending position too. So you'll need to be able to write that down too. And shears or a knife is uh, always a good idea. Uh, bring that along and uh, an SMB. It's all your standard equipment. I don't think there's anything here in this kit that you don't already have. Uh, a whistle, right? I don't know if people have a whistle, but you should have a whistle because you're, it's it's a long ways out there. You know, you're kind of on Tanker's Reef and you're in, you're a long way from help. You know, uh, it's a long. It, there's people walking on the shore, but there's not a lot of divers out there. And so you want if you have an emergency, you want to be able to get help. So a whistle would be a good thing to have. And of course, some clips for clipping things off. So how to get a lane assignment. So you sign up for the lane assignment at this thing right here, g2krlink.com, get a lane. And when you do that, and then you view your assignment at this link right here, and it will populate your name on this, uh, in the next spot, 
right? So these are all like made up things, right? These registration numbers. But um, when you when you put in your name and registration number on this website, on this link here, it will um, it will give you an assignment. And then you view your assignment, you click on it here, and your name will be right here. And that will be the next assignment. So if, if I were to enter it right now, I would be at grid C west zero meters is my starting point on, on the grid. Lane C going west. There's two lanes, east and west. I'll explain what those are. And that's how you do it there. So um, only one person from your buddy team needs to get the assignment, right? So Josh and Nick are going out. Josh can get the assignment or Nick can get the assignment, but you both shouldn't get an assignment because only one of one one person in your team needs to get it. But when you report data, both of you will report data. You don't you can't report it as as a buddy team. So uh, I'm going to I want to show this in this class. OK, so I am going. Let me see how I can do it. Um, an example for how this goes. Um, bear with me a second here. Uh, Okay. So this is how you get the color the the calling assignment, right? And I'll send you the this is I just jumped into this link. Um so it's all good done with Google Forms. So you this is the calling assignment and the required fields are, I don't know why there's two of them. So I'm going to put in Keith and my registration number is number one. And there's some information here about how, what the steps are and I'll hit submit. And then I can go here. And here's the assignment, right? So Keith, number one, this is, I just did this. My next assignment is grid C West zero, and I'll tell you more what that means. And so uh, basically get your assignment before the weekend. You know, you're going to go out the weekend, whatever, during the week, you know, but every Tuesday at nine o'clock, I'm just going to clear them all off, right? Because I'm, I'm going to figure if you haven't reported your, your, you know, I'll look at what has been done, but I'll make new assignments at that time. And if there's unfinished assignments, I'm just going to take them off and uh, we'll, we'll reset them. Okay. Um, all right, let's go to the next thing here. So what this looks like. Um, so you start out and from shore you see the large white buoy, you're going to swim out there and you start at the white buoy. That's what it looks like, but now it has a flag on it. It says G2K on it. It's a 24 inch mooring ball uh, sitting there. There's condos on the shore and uh, go, to this, go to the starting point. Wow. So you can go over there and then descend on the buoy line and at the base you'll follow the short line to the location which is and then they have tags on it it's f right just label on it and follow the cable to find your lane assignment you know, find this lane underwater there and each lane is five meters wide by 100 meters long so if there would be a tape that runs this doesn't show up but there would be a tape that runs down f at this point, and you're going to be on either the east side or the west side of that tape between the tape and that cave line is where you're going to be. So it looks like this. Here's that tape going down. It starts at zero and it runs down this way. And this is lane F east, right? So two divers go side by side. You're smashing urchins all along this area. You started at zero and you go along as long as you can. And that was the assignment, lane F east zero. And then, so you're going to go along. Uh, head south, calling urchins, boy. Saying it. So you're going to go down the line right here, calling urchins as best you can until you reach a stopping point. And so you're low on air, you reach 70 meters. I'm done, I'm cold, Just done smashing urchins. You record, write down 70 meters on your slate and uh, that's it, you're done. Mark a slate with zero to 70 meters on your tape and that's what you'll report later on. Send with the surface marker buoy. You can put an SMB 
and pop it and, it and surface there. Or you can go to a corner or another buoy and ascend on a buoy for safety, right? You don't really want to ascend out here in the middle because some boat might come take you. So, and this is what it looks like when you when you stop. It has a, the tape will be right there. Um, though some of these tapes have feet and meters on them, so it might be a little bit uh, uh, confusing to uh, flip it over necessarily. If you reach the end, then you can come back the other way. So this is your um, uh, say you go all the way to the end, then you would go east at that point and go to the next lane and go down there, and um, then you would record that you got F east to 100, and then you go to the next lane east and continue, and then you're getting low on air at 90 in the new lane, and you stop, and so you're going to record G west 90 meters, and then go to the corner and ascend and always save enough air. And go through this. So recording, collecting and recording data. So record the time you spent calling urchins, not your total bottom time, right? So let's say it, you you start from shore and it takes you, you know, you spend 20 minutes getting out of there. Well, that didn't really count towards smashing urchins. So just count the time that you smashed the urchins, right? We want to look for a unit of effort uh, that you spent calling urchins, not your total bottom time. And where you did it, like, so you know the where you were on the grid or on the watch buoy and what number you were on and um, start and stop points for that. Anything else you found noteworthy, like all these things, marine mammals, invasive species, accidental damage to marine life or trash that you find on the reef. Or if you find damage to the grid lines of the buoys, make a note of that too. There's, there's spots in the recording data where you, can, where you can enter that information and any other comments you have. So this is how you would report your data. So log every dive at this link or each, each diver will have, have to do that. And then I want to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to open up another one of these. And I'm just going to go back. And do um, log your dive. OK, so this is what this looks like. So each diver has to complete the log entry. Not not just the one who did the, the assignment, and if you're just practicing it, right? I'm just I'm just gonna play around here. I'll hit a yes. And I'm just gonna practice, and it's not gonna it's not gonna save my data. It'll actually appear, but it, we won't save it. So uh, my name is Keith, and my registration number is one, and I'll just put in the date of one of all ones, and I was let's say I was on the cable grid, right? And I'll hit next. And I started at lane F and I was on the east side and I went from my began at zero and I ended at uh, said 70 and uh, I also ended on the east side. Ending lane. Oh, oh ending lane. Oh, I'm sorry. Ending lane is not that ending lane is F. And my ending number was 70. I, I did it wrong. OK, 70. That's how you enter that. And distance traveled. This is like a check number kind of to see if if it makes sense that you went from 0 to 70 and, and you're reporting 70. But um, it's just it, it, it doesn't really have a val. It doesn't really have it. It'll help to clarify things if there's an error. Like, like if you went all the way around to G and you said you only went 20 meters or if you told me I only went, um, you know, I went 280, 280 feet or something. Well, then maybe you're reading feet instead of meters. Maybe I could spot an error by you doing that, that 70. And then what happened? So time spent calling urchins. I was down there for 60 minutes. And um, this is optional. You don't have to count urchins. I'm just going to say 60 minutes. I didn't count any urchins. And then any comments, I'm going to say I have comments. Uh, and then my comments are going to be, uh, um, um, a, a shot and otter and um, incidental damage. Uh, I I did find a sargassum gas um, on uh, the um, A. Let's say trash removed. Any other damage on the reef? Any other comments? Uh, this was fun. And then submit. Right. So after I've submitted, 
Then it goes to this little tiny URL, reef check dive log, reef dive log, and then you can look at your data. I just reported one on here, and this will refresh at some point, and you'll see all this data that we've been playing around with here is all in this in this form now too. So it all gets put into that place, and that's how we, you know, it look at us at totals and things like that. But um, number of dives and all that kind of stuff. And, and this is the same form that they're using on the North Coast. So there's parity between uh, this and the other project. So I'll take that out of there. Uh, this is um, snapshot. So. Uh, some of the other things I was talking about, the things in the comments, is marine mammal disturbance. Uh, you want to report any marine mammal disturbance, and what a marine mammal disturbance is considered is um, if you see an otter and it in in some way notices you and like dives because it saw you, that's considered a disturbance. So you don't want to come within about 50 feet of an otter uh, when you're diving, or by boat you want to you want to keep about 100 feet away. Um, I, there's about five otters that frequent this site at this time. So, um, and you can just avoid them as best you can. I know it's kind of like they're approaching me. Why do they get the right? But um, that's the deal. They, they were very sensitive about it in, in doing the reporting that we don't, um, um, we, we, re, we self report. It's not like, you're not gonna get in trouble for reporting it, but it's good to report it. If you were out there and one was disturbed, whatever, and did a duck dive, just write it into your reporting. Uh, invasive species. So there's invasive species in Monterey now. There's a uh, Sargassum horneri, which is um, found in Southern California. Uh, very often is found in Long Beach 2003, uh, and it's spread all over Southern California, and it's been spotted in Monterey in June of last year. So we're on the lookout for it. This is the actual specimen that was found in uh, in Monterey uh, on breakwater. It was found June 4th, and uh, it was it was found and uh, removed, but there there might be more. We want to look for it. We want to make sure because if this ever you know, you think urchins are bad. This is going to be worse, you know, because it'll it'll outcompete the kelp. You'll, you'll never get a chance with this stuff, and it's, it's no way to remove it. So we have to watch for it at the first outbreak of this and bring it to their attention so we can stop it in Monterey. Right now, it's mostly south of Santa Barbara. So uh, this is what it looks like up close. This sargassum, um, it has these uh, little bladders that are round bladders, right? And um, and this is the actual reproductive part right here is this big seed thing right here. This is the part that um, makes it reproductive. But these little bladders make it float. So it's a big bush. And the ends of the leaves have this kind of a look to them, kind of like a split little serrated edge on the end of the leaves of the sargassum. Um, so that's the single air bladders. There's the reproductive part. There's the young branches. Oh, it's all really well spied. So yeah, you can report it right away uh, if you see it. Just let me know, and and we'll I'll report it to UCSC about where they can find it. There's another one too that is um, locally found. It's called Stephanocystis. Um, used to be called something else before. I forget. They 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 recategorized it. But it has these little bladders too. But they're chain bladders. See how they're little all together, little little like a I don't know how do you describe that like little. Uh, smaller compartments that are round. It's in that, and and that's the difference you can tell. They're more like a string of pearls, chain of pearls is how they're describing it here. And what, where these ones are for sargassum is very different, has these large ones. But we see a lot of of, of Stephanocystis in Monterey. It's one of the one of the early colonizers, so you'll see it. It has these strange looking leaves on it that kind of start first, and and it'll grow up. And I, we just don't want to have false reportings that people think they they see this and report it as sargassum when it's not. And there's another invasive species. It's called uh, water cipera, uh, water cipera subtorquata, and it's all over the harbor. If you ever dove uh, wharf two, you'll see it there. It's on all the pilings, a lot of the pilings from top to bottom, and um, uh, it's oh, yeah, very for sure, very photographic. You know, I think I, I saw one recently. Someone took a picture of sorry, of a fringe head on that. Uh, Water cipra, and it looks beautiful. If you go to the, if you ever did the Monterey shootout, the winners are um, 
things that are shot on sargassa on on water cipra so um if it's like a like a potato chip kind of thing but it's a little it's a bryzoa and it's a different kind of a organizational structure it's little has little zoids that are in a matrix and um they basically reproduce very easily any piece of it can act like a tumbleweed and just go along dropping zoids everywhere and so it's one of the early colonizers on the reef and um they're very brittle if you touch it it breaks off it will stain your gloves red or any any color on your suit it will change it to red uh it will um and it it's very breakable and and urchins eat it um which is kind of like you'd say well urchins eat it that sounds like a good thing but it's actually a bad thing because we're getting rid of all the urchins right so then this thing will have awesome opportunity to live and to thrive without being eaten so um we want to keep an eye on it and make sure that this early colonizer doesn't just take over the reef because it grows so quickly and easily and it's right next to the wharf which has a lot of it so um Diving on the orange and red buoys, it's a little, so orange is for the trained divers and the gray is for the untrained divers that come off the boat. Um, you're within the project area. You're not gonna be going over. If you're diving on one of these buoys, you're not gonna meander off and start going onto the grid and start calling. You'll only work on that on that buoy and uh, and don't meander over the that sand channel and start going into the treatment area also. But we're gonna keep moving them around uh, on on the on the reef as conditions change, as we need to. Basically, the the idea is to start with the grid, and then we'll just keep on expanding outward from the grid and taking on more and more area. Have a persistent effort that just keeps spanning um, over the entire about 60 acres of treatment area. So on the orange buoy, this is what it looks like. So there's the, the orange buoy comes down. There's an anchor there. There's a a hundred meter tape that goes down and your assignment will look something like five to ten meters east right so that's the assignment five to ten meters east and these are like imaginary lines right so you don't have the grid lines like on the on the grid you just have these marks on the tape and you have to try and go as best you can in that direction calling all the urchins you know you might meander sideways you could be off 30 degrees whatever it could be that way but that's okay you just do the best you can and if if this if your lane next to you is clear maybe that'll help you to guide you um along a, a, the, this imaginary line now josh had made a good idea and that was maybe instead of making an imaginary line you make a real line like use your use your reel attach it here and then run out pretty far run out 100 feet or whatever drop the reel and just make it straight and then you have lines of your own to to go between to guide you as you do your work that's a great idea whatever can make you go straight you just don't want to be off like go out and come back or something <laughs> um so you're working side by side between the imaginary lines five meters apart and try to maintain your heading as best you can and if you can go over your imaginary lines that's that's okay you don't don't feel like you can't you know because it's not yours or something um there's they can't like uh, uh, there's no escape right so uh and then when you're done just come up at the buoy right uh, the best way to come back is um come back when you're low on air and don't run out of air right you're not keep watching that even though you're busy and uh, send on the line for safety and want to have air at the surface. These, you guys know this stuff. So uh, happy and safe diving. Uh, you're a big place. You're far from help. Make sure you have positive buoyancy and use a whistle or wave. There's lots of people that are walking on up and down the beach or on a boat, whatever. Just try to get someone else's attention to help you. Uh, get your buddy on the shore or on a boat if you can. And um, uh, call 911 or ask someone else. There's lots of people walking the beach that have a phone. Ask them to call them, tell them where you are. Don't tell them you're at Tankers Reef. They'll never know where that is. Tell them you're at uh, Del Monte Beach because they'll recognize that one. Um, and you minister the first aid. So where can you legally call urchins in Monterey? Right, That's the next question. Well, it's only legal to call an unlimited number of urchins within the Tankers Reef boundary. Um, and you have to keep your license in your immediate possession, right? So if you're diving, it doesn't. that's not... They, they, that is an exception. You don't have to carry it with you when you're diving, but uh, have it back on shore, have it in your car, 
um, or if you're diving from a boat, keep it on the boat. Uh, it is not legal to call urchins anywhere else, uh, except for in Casper Cove in, in Mendocino, which is six and a half hours away. I don't think you're going to do that. Um, we have an urchin uh, lovers three urchin experiment. Uh, if you're involved in reef check or if you want to contact them, there is an experiment there where they're, they're also calling urchins too. So that's another legal place to do it. But it's really not legal to call urchins in these marine protected areas at all because there's no take of invertebrate life. You can take all the fish you want. You just can't take any invertebrates out of these marine protected areas uh, that are the rest of the peninsula. And it's um, otherwise you're only allowed to take 35 urchins outside of the marine protected areas. That's the law. So if I was if I was here somehow, uh, not uh, outside of a marine protected area, but not in the boundary, I could do I could I could take 35 urchins, which means I have to remove them from the water. Uh, and that's the rule for everywhere else outside of marine protected areas. And basically diving in Monterey, anytime you dip your toe in the water, you're basically in a marine protected area. Uh, from here, from from this point all the way around to Point Lobos, it's pretty much all MPAs. So the only place really is here. And that's what we learned so far. We don't need to really talk about that so much. More ways to get involved. You can join Reef Check. Uh, the Waterman's Alliance is, is co coordinating things on the North Coast. So they have a Facebook page. And if you feel so like, I really love calling urchins, I want to do it in a different place, you can go to the North Coast and do it up in Casper Cove. And this is what I was thinking about for, for gooey divers and how you guys can help. Because um, I have other things that I need to do. And I'm hoping that you guys, since you're so skilled at all these things and you have scooters and can get out there, that there's other things that not not right now, but like in the future as we go through this, I need help with other things. And basically, I need help inspecting and maintaining all, my, all this fishing gear that we're doing out there. You know, the fishing gear maintenance ends up taking along a big percentage of time. And right now, I'm the only one doing it. So um, once everyone gets up to speed and stuff, I'm hoping you guys can help me with some of that. And then replacing the grid divider lines too, like those those strings that go across those cave lines. Well, the urchins eat it, you know, because it happens is it grows like a marine growth on it, like brown algae, and then they like to eat that, and they'll just jump on the line and eat the line, and they'll they'll kill it with their jaws. So uh, those lines are going to have to be inspected and replaced, you know, periodically. We may need to, we may need to do different materials in the future. So there's that, and then. What I like to do too is for the gray buoy, like use scooters and just cruise around out there and find where they're the densest, right? Like a real dense patch of urchins and just uh, mark it with an SMB, either send an SMB to the surface and come back with a boat and, and, and mark it with a GPS. Or there's another concept that Josh was talking about where you have the GPS with you and you raise it to the surface and get your point and then lower it back down. And you're basically prospecting, right? You're like, look, you're digging for gold, urchin gold, and you're going around finding the densest patches. And that's where we'll put the gray buoy and we'll send all the, the divers on the boat there to basically reduce urchin density and big, in big ways because urchins are really patchy, right? I mean, um, I said there's seven urchins per square meter on the site, but the, the deviation is hilarious. Sometimes there's like none and sometimes there's 1200. So um, they just vary quite a bit. It's it's consistently inconsistent is what's going on out there. Um, so uh, prospecting for them would be helpful. And then moving buoys to new locations and setting up the, the tape reels would be after we get that gray buoy where it is, we have to go down and set that up on the reel, put the hammers down there and maintain a hammer inventory, right? Like there's some, some there's a handful you know, of, of hammers down there. People might not return them and take them back to a dive shop or whatever, or, or give them back. And then we have to take them back out there. So that has to be maintained too, because I, I, I think it'd be good to have hammers out there already instead of people bringing their own hammers. It just seems safer to me to not have people on boats and traveling around with hammers. Um, it's better if it was already there and they could just like borrow it and return it. So, um, and then um, where there's my, my first area of importance is the kelp. There's some kelp out there already. I don't want it to die because that kelp is going to reseed the entire area. So 
my first priority is actually to go and call the urchins on the high value places. And that's where I could use people that are good at this, that can go and find where the kelp is and go and get all the urchins off the kelp and off from around the kelp. And because you don't want that kelp to die because that's, it's really hard to start over again. And then if you have a camera, it's a good, good opportunity for you. You're going to see the same place multiple times. So, and there's a grid there to tell you where you are. So you can go to A, whatever, <laughs> and take a picture of something and then come back in the fall and take the same picture of the same place and document for yourself what happened. You know, did by moving all these urchins, did, did this kelp flourish? Did it get thicker? And you can help to document that by taking like basically your own before and after pictures because you'll know where you are at, at, both, at, at both times. Uh, here's some additional information from where you can learn out more about invertebrates and so on. Okay. And this is our partners in the project. Uh, here's our logo, the Giant Kelp Restoration Project, and here's Reef Check. Uh, we're kind of, uh, this is, a, uh, they're a non-government uh, non organization and they're doing, they did all the monitoring out there too. But this group right here in the middle, the Ocean Protection Council, Fish and Wildlife, these guys here are the state agencies that are, uh, that are our partners in the effort. And Abalone Company too, which is right there on the wharf, they've been really good with us too. And we do Urchinomics, Get Inspires in Southern California, Bradley for Photographic, he's in right there in Pacific Grove and he wants to shoot great pictures of this whole thing. So we're excited to get him on board. And this is some of the sponsors. So you kind of know like, like who's paying for all this, right? So you guys are, everybody is. It's it's grassroots funded. It's not we're we're not beholden to uh, any non-government organization. Um, sustainable Surf is uh, they're they're surfers. They wanted to help out. They gave us a bunch of money. And Louise Woolley, who's a reef check diver, gave us a generous donation, and that paid for all reef checks work out there and paid for the grid. Um, we have a GoFundMe site that people donate to. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a lot of money to do this sort of thing. It's just a hammer. It costs six dollars. You know, and I think, you know, someone's got to pay, but uh, I think that, you know, everyone buying their own license and, and getting the, you know, the, the rec divers getting that class, that'll, you know, that's, that's paying for it right there. So, um, yeah, that's all good. You know, we're, we're in good shape. We're funded. A lot of times projects get started and they're waiting on funding. We're not waiting on funding. We have everything we need to get going. And that's kind of it. That's some additional material. Oh, I want to talk about messaging too. Just... When you're talking about this with people, try not to use words like we're killing or we're going to kill them all or something like that or smashing or crushing. Try to use words like we're suppressing or we're calling, right? Be sensitive to that because, you know, divers understand it, but um, the general public is going to have second, you know, they're going to be kind of squeamish on us going out and killing cr creatures in the ocean. So be aware of that and try when you, if you post or you tell people things in a social environment, you know, try to use softer words for it. You know, like all of all of my uh, my hammers, you know, they all have have pink on them, right? We're trying to like make it uh, more uh, you know, easier, you know, like uh, uh, less aggressive if we can. Um, yeah, and if if uh, you know, we don't want, we don't want things. The other thing we go really bad too is if um, people start going into the marine protected areas with a hammer. And start doing things there and then start taking pictures of it and putting it on social media and fish and wildlife is going to see that and i mean they don't have that they don't have a, a real deep ear but uh it will be, it'll be brought to their attention and then they'll have to do something and what they could do is they could shut it down and it would someone someone doing something crazy like that you know we have to just be patient right and do what we can in a in a controlled way that's not going to get us all kicked off the project right um we're lucky to have this and so we want to be able to scale this up and not get kicked off so uh updates to the program i have uh a this is for for um for the uh, for the instructors but uh i have a newsletter that i will send to everybody you're registered if you register you, you will register for this and uh i'll send a newsletter with updates to you and any updates to protocols because you know with anything like this it's it's brand new it's going to change constantly you know i'm basically an inexperienced volunteer i'm learning how this is going to go and so there will be changes and i'll i'll that's the way i will reach out to you uh through this newsletter and also on that assignment portal I'll, I could put information there 
about changes to protocols and things like that. So that's where that's kind of the only way that that not my first line of communication with you. But that said, we have the website and uh, any amendments to this kind of project will go into this curriculum folder. But this item number three, you're not going to have it. This is for instructors, so I didn't need to put that in there. Um, and this is just some specific language that you don't really need to know. This is their criteria for success. OK, cool. So that's all I got. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a, a question. So you mentioned the, the kelp hold fast and as well as so there's a previous slide about like where we should like we should only try to call the urchins when they're on rock or sand. So if mm -hmm. we see the urchins like we saw on Saturday, we saw yeah. urchins swarming like right on a kelp hold fast. Should we try to call them directly on the hold fast or like, you know, use no. a dive knife and move them off yeah. onto the sand and exactly. Yeah, there? exactly. Get them off the kelp hold fast first before you call them. You know, I, 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 what I, what I do is I go up to the kelp hold fast and I try to find where they kind of burrow in and I get a knife and I pop them out of those areas okay. or, or I can do like on this hammer, it's got a pointy end on it and I can kind of get in there a little bit and get them off the hold fast and get them on, get them on the rock around the hold fast is where I kill them. And then I look up and realize, oh, the whole thing's loaded. It's the whole thing is full of urchins, right? So right. Um, before you get too happy on the hold fast and removing them, look up and uh, yeah. shake the tree, you know, get them all, get them off there, you know, and because what they do is they start on the hold fast, they climb up to the top and they weigh it down, they weigh it and then they bring it to their buddies, right? And then they all gang tackle it, right? That's, <laughs> right. that's how they operate. So if you can, you know, sometimes I'm like swimming up kind of a ways, you know, and get them off of that, shake them all off. And, uh, you know, sometimes I even like, I get all the snails off, you know, basically you don't want anything to eat your kelp, right? <laughs> so get it all off of them. Uh, you know, don't smash the snails, but, uh, make them start over and, uh, uh, get them off the kelp that way. Um, yeah, th there's sometimes too, when there's, they're in these little cracks that are kind of, they're in pockets in these little burrow pockets and you're kind of wondering, boy, should I really go after them in there? You know, um, I think it's OK. I think if you didn't go after them in the pockets, you wouldn't be killing anything because they're mostly in the pockets, probably 90 percent of them. So you're going to have to go for it. Um, but just be be really careful of not smashing everything out around the pocket kind of thing. Yeah, good got question. It. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, you know, taking pictures. Like, is there sort of a formal way to submit our pictures, or do we just keep um, copies? I, or? I, I had this idea of making like a like a shared Google Drive kind of thing where people could put stuff. We could set something up like that, you know, where you can put things there. Or, I mean, you can always just email them to me, you know. And, okay. and what I'm what I'm doing is kind of keeping a record of it. I have a, a catalog of them. You know, send me your good good pictures. You know, send me things that that you wouldn't show somebody. <laughs> but um, yeah, show you know, send me your good pictures. And what I'll do too is, um, I have um, a media drive that uh, if we have really good stuff, that I will make it available to reporters and magazines and um, news stations and stuff like that that are looking for stuff because they don't have a camera crew to go underwater. You know, at the Channel Eight News. But we have those pictures. We just make them available to them there. And that saves them a lot of trouble. And we get good pictures. So I guess the answer is for now, you can just email them. And if you, and, and if you have any questions or, or pictures, just send them to Keith at G2KR.com. Um, that would be the way to, to, to reach that. Um, there's if you all the links that I sent to you. Let me see. Um, are all on a single place. I'm going to share my screen again. And it will be, shoot. Go back, go back. Yeah, I'm not doing it right. It's G to get our link. There it is. So if you go to this site, G2KR link, you can also get to this, go to the website, G2KR.com. And then this is, it shows you all the links that we talked about today and the required documents and everything like that. I'll send you all guys uh, waiver, stuff like that. 
but this is where all the links are and you can just click on them and and go into those assignments uh, there's some shortcut names that you can use as well uh, so Keith, uh, yes. what are the next what are the next steps? Like uh, we signed the waiver, and then we have to meet you uh, for a dive, so you could show us how it's done, right? Yeah. So let's look at it right here. So this is kind of going back to the at the beginning. So we've done this. We're asking questions now. We're getting through here. You, some of you got your fishing license, or you need to get a fishing license. Yeah, uh, I think I right just here. got mine yesterday. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. Good. Yeah. And then. Um, Register for the G2KR.com. Uh, there's that link there for it. It's registration right here. One time volunteer diver registration. You'll just go on that and go and takes about three minutes. You'll do that. So, so this is uh, this is different from the one we already registered for what for volunteering. No, I think he's uh, many of you already did. It's the same one. It's the same. Okay, one. so we're, we don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. If you haven't done it already, then you would need to do it. But okay, yes. Yeah, don't, you don't, don't do it, don't do it twice. Is... You'll just you'll just confuse me if you do it twice, because I'll be right. like, yeah, because I have two hundred names and I, it's hard for me to tell who's already done it. Yeah. So uh, there's that way. Um, there's I an online. I think everybody here has already done it. Oh, great, great, perfect. So we, we all save three minutes. Uh, perfect. Um, then there's an online quiz. I'll I'll email you a link to it. And basically, uh -huh. the online quiz is just so that I can tell how this material is landing with people you know if we're if we're getting the main points of, uh, across in uh -huh. uh, the presentation so uh if you can help me with that it's about uh, i think it's 20 questions 25 questions and I'll, I'll send you that link to that uh you can uh -huh. take it there and then i'll send you a waiver too if you could take the waiver and either uh, uh send a picture of it uh, you can take a picture of the second page if you like uh, uh -huh. e email that to me and then okay that'll be it and then we'll plan a dive and oh and uh that will take some logistics to to coordinate that but just um uh -huh. you let me know when you're going out there and i'll 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 see if i can if okay. i can be with you uh okay I'm, I'm i'm out there uh basically well this week's a little exceptional but you can come out there thursday friday saturday and sunday uh, i'm out on on the, the the place so if you're there for the weekend then we definitely can uh, meet up there and uh I, and I just basically, I mean, you guys know how you guys know how to do it, but um, you know, I just want to make sure it's everyone's doing it in the right way, and that if there's some errors or you know something, we can correct it early and not, you know, I, I kind of need to stay on top of it. Um, right. And that's all. We well, just, we'll just, you know, we'll just get started. We'll talk about things a uh -huh. little bit at the beginning, and then you'll go and you'll do your normal uh, dive and. Um, crushing a bunch of urchins and reporting the data and I'll be looking at all of that you know how, how you do the assignment how you uh, how you report your data and I'm giving you some uh -huh. feedback and and give me feedback too you know if you know you're confused by the portal and I don't know what, what you know what, what, something just let me know because you're you're probably not the first we're all learning this together so for sure so yeah. uh, I had I was a little confused just to, uh, uh, I just want to make sure I'm on the right, on the same page. If you go to that, gr if you, if you go to that picture where you actually show the grid and the two divers looking to start the assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that one, you know, like this one here, these guys here. Yeah. When they start. So yeah. So now, uh, if you get a lane number and you have to go East, if you look at yeah. if you look at the uh, right by where it says shore, there's a north, south, east, west. Yes. Uh, uh, Compass rose. Marking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that. Uh, so you, so if you if you were to start east, would you actually line yourself up? Uh, okay, west to east. Right. So yeah, I, I think see, this so, kind of describes it better, right? So here's the two divers. And they're uh -huh. on the F east. So they're on the east side of this tape. Right? Between the tape and the 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 yellow cave line. And oh, that's I see. the so that's the lane they're in. Even though you're going north to south, you call that you call that east because the because No, no. It's east because you're on the east side of F. So there's F oh, right? F has two uh, parts. You could have the west or the east. I see. Yeah, I oh, see. I see. That's a good question. I, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. because it's yeah, because, because you're headed you south, that, right? You're headed towards shore. You're, you're headed, headed south. south, exactly. Yeah, yeah you're, you're going, headed south. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. And then on the on the buoys, it kind of behaves a different way, right? Because then you're going, 
east is actually your heading, <laughs> right? On the buoys, you're going right. east or west on headings. Oh yeah, on so. the orange buoy, you're actually heading east. Uh, uh, that's correct. Yeah, you're heading from uh, west to east. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, like here towards the like, grid. Like here, you could go yeah east towards the grid, right, or west, yeah. right. So that's it's kind of it's. I'm using the same words, but they mean different things here in, when they're on a yeah, buoy yeah. or on the grid, right? So, uh -huh. yeah, good, good question. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that 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 could confuse people a little bit because they're heading north to south, but they're on the west of F. Where right. Says F. They're east of F, uh, right. or west of F. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll have to look at if see the way I can clarify that, or maybe I can just emphasize that point to people too. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And then and then how far is how far is the grid? Let's say we start on the orange buoy because that's your high value target, right? You're trying to get all the urgence of the kelp so we could preserve the kelp. Uh, yeah. How far is the grid, like the the, uh, the A, the A tape? How far is it from the uh, orange orange uh, buoy? Oh, not very far at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, if I were to show it here, like this is where the grid is. The orange buoy uh -huh. is sitting, sitting right out here. Right, you can see where my okay. cursor is. Orange is over here, and the gray is sitting over here. They're okay. they're, they're they're kind of proximate to each other right now, um, but as things progress, you know, the orange buoy is going to move along. You know, we're gonna we're gonna have all the divers go down there and have them going all going in the west direction, and then it's, they'll call uh -huh. they'll call a bunch, and then we'll move the whole thing over again, and then we'll send them out and have them go west again, and we'll just keep on, you know, uh, uh -huh. pressing outward from that, you know, and. Hey, uh, hey. And you want us to work on the orange first, right? From what I understand. Yeah, for the orange buoy for you guys because um, there's some kelp there. Basically, I, I'm not. It's, it's a, I don't have a good drawing of it here, but in this area, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. This is where the cable grid is. There's there's healthy kelp all over here on the north side of it. There's a big healthy kelp bed, and I want to preserve that. I, I don't I don't want it to die. There's otters that are in it. And they're, they're they're foraging in it, but this is kind of a high value area to me because uh -huh. the normal swell is is this direction from the northwest. So if we can keep this alive and reproductive, then all of this kelp will just oh, yeah. populate this area, right? It'll populate our grid. So makes sense. Yeah. Even though for the authorities they want us to clear the grid, first things first, the kelp. <laughs> the kelp is first. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, yeah. What, so when, when you happens... want to get an assignment, uh, just go on the uh -huh. assignment there. But um, you know, the assignments are like uh, up for the grid right now. So um, when when you want an assignment, you can just email me. How's that? Just email me okay. and say I need an orange assignment, and we'll we'll get you. Make sure you get an orange one um, okay. over there. And and right now the orange buoy, I just set it there. There's no tape measure on it. So okay. hope, like this weekend, I'll go and pull a tape measure on it and then it'll make sense to people. I'll put a tape measure on the gray and the and, and the orange buoys. But it's been kind of we had some problems with the wreck divers getting out there and everything's kind of slow um, because we had problems with the boats and they want us to have commercial fishing licenses to put a dive charter boat, uh -huh. putting wreck divers in the water. It's all crazy. It's all just crazy. So the the other question I had was so when you start on the orange buoy from the tape measure, what happens when you hit the cable grid? Do you turn back? Yeah, don't go on the cable grid. Okay, so you turn yeah. back. Yeah, because then the the cable grid kind of becomes an exclusion area, basically. Right. Yeah, you don't because then it would it would you'd be putting effort that's undocumented. They want to document the effort on the on the cable grid, definitely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, basically. Uh, the other side of the sand channel and the cable grid becomes an exclusion area if you're on the orange buoys or orange or gray buoys. Okay. Good. And then, uh, so is is the cable grid only? Uh, so when 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 do you expect us to work on the cable grid, or is it cable grid exclusively for scientific divers? No, oh, it's not for scientific divers, but it'll okay. be next. You know, I want to. First thing is, I want to protect the kelp, 
right? And there's there's okay. kelp on the cable yeah, grid. Of course. You know, there's kelp uh-huh. there, and I think uh, you know I've been oh, yeah. going around trying to get it over there. Um, but I, all that kelp that's kind of around there, I think, is a is a high priority. And it may be that we kind of mix it up a little bit. You know, like you guys are working on the orange buoy, saving the uh, protecting the kelp, and then we have new divers that are coming into the program, and they go on the cable grid. And then we have divers that are coming in off the boats. You know, they've never done this mm-hmm. before; they're untrained. They can go on the gray. You know, and there's room for everybody. You know, right? Uh, to be doing this kind of thing. So, but right. it's up to me to kind of to manage this in a way uh-huh. that as a strategy for the urchin, you know, sure. uh, depression, you know, over the area. And uh, that's going to be interesting to you. But it's basically the idea is you're just going to be persistent. You know, we'll start on the grid and we'll clear the grid and we'll move out and then we'll start back over at the grid again and we'll do uh-huh. it again and just keep reducing it with multiple passes and just keep pushing out in a large and sustained effort uh, emanating from basically ground zero is that cable grid. And uh, we'll just keep keep moving outward from there. Um, yeah, I like guess really inconsistent. You know, there's some sections like over here, there's no urchins. I don't know why, but there's no urchins here. Uh-huh. It, but there's lots of it here. You know, I don't know. There's all kinds of strange stuff. There's anchors yeah. out there, mold tankers and stuff yeah. that were out in the site. So, but yeah, it's really inconsistent, you know. You know, I think that's what me and Nick saw. You know, we, it was kind of scattered all over the place. It wasn't just uniform. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Josh Hona Mitchell did a survey, and he went like, he went out here. He like came, he started. I think he came here, and he went like, but he kind of went this way along, like where the sand meets, kind of like in this area. And this was last. This is before COVID, right? So it was 2019, and there was all kinds of kelp out there. And this in the survey he oh. did, we, he had a camera looking down, and it was kelp the whole time. So um, it's really changed a lot, you know. Now there's just a little bit of kelp, and it the kelp you'll see is not looking very good, you know. It's not like the kelp you see at the breakwater or something that's really big and has all these stipes on it. It's kind of scraggly looking. It's kind of like it's like ten stipes, you know. It's not really robust, you know. Yeah, so, like the kelp that we saw was like you know barely hanging on there. Yeah, it's kind of anemic looking. You're like, this is not good kelp, you know. And so, yeah, hopefully. You know, we can get it to flourish, you know, and basically on the bottom of a kelp plant is where its reproductive fronds are. They're all at the bottom, right? And once it gets a lot of that going, then it has primary production and then it can put spores out over about a 500 foot, 500 to 1,000 foot range. I, I think it's like more like, a, I think it's exaggerating. I think it's like 250 feet or something. It doesn't go very far um, because the, 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 all the spores are at the bottom of the plant. Right. So they just have to go in the current washing around right there. You know, how far can the current take it? You know, where like a bull kelp is as reproduction at the top. Right. So it puts its spores in the water and they go like all over the coast. You know, so that's why there's a lot. Um, you'll find that bull kelp is is a really fast and early uh, colonizer on these on these sites that, uh, that that grow there. So, yeah, I had, I had one more question. Um mm-hmm. Uh, I was reading about uh, some of the efforts that was done in Southern California. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, what I read was they basically cut the uh, healthy part of the kelp, the blades where mm-hmm. the uh, uh, the seeds are, and they yeah. put it in a sporophyll mesh bag about a meter yeah. off the substrate. And mm-hmm. after the urchin baron was cleared, mm-hmm. and they just let it scatter all around. I mean, is that something... That's 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 a possibility. Actually, very much a possibility. There's lots. There are. There's lots more going on than just the uh, urchin thing. There's, we, we're yeah. doing drone drone survey. Uh, we're doing underwater robotics survey of the grid too. Uh, we're doing kelp outplanting out in this area over here. There's a, a researcher from UC Santa Cruz. She's doing her doctoral thesis on kelp. Uh, different two different species of of giant kelp. They're gonna try it out over here. Uh, we have this idea of doing that kelp bag thing too on these uh, concrete oh, nice. uh, cylinders that are going to be out somewhere over here somewhere. We have 28 cylinders. We'll be putting them out there. Um, the, there is an experiment from Moss Landing where they're going to do green gravel. Uh, wow. Basically, it's um, small kelps uh, growing on little gravels, and then they spread them out on the bottom, and hopefully they grow kind of thing. Oh, nice. So there'll be, there'll be that going on too. And that's also that kind of outplanting idea is also happening at the other project. That's at Lover's uh-huh. Point. That's a reef check project too. So there's definitely uh, some in, lots of interest in kelp outplanting. There's interest in um, taking the urchins out and ranching them 
and fattening wow. them up for um, for food. So, I mean, there's lots of things, other things going on that, that will benefit wow. from this too. Um, and and kelp kelp out planting is definitely one of them. It, it's hard to do. You know, they did it in Southern California, like you said, and they put little uh, bags, uh, uh, burlap bags, and swam around with with sporophytes and stuff. And it took seven years for it to, mm. for it to work. Uh -huh. And basically, what happened was they didn't have kelp for at all, and they had to go okay. 20 miles to get kelp that would they thought would would work, right? And then they grew it in the classrooms. And all these all these kids started growing kelp in their classrooms, and they brought it out and they and they swam around with these sporophytes and they put them in the water. They tried this, they tried that, they tried all these different ways, and uh -huh. the and the kelp grew up, but it didn't reach the surface. It stopped oh. about five feet short of the surface. They couldn't figure out why, but it was because the oceanographic um, uh, conditions weren't weren't suited for it. It wasn't a lot right. of nutrients, right? So uh -huh. it didn't reach the surface. But then it did reach the surface. And then everyone's so happy. And then that winter, it uh, the storms took it and put it on the beach. And then uh, the, the Nancy Caruso, who, who did that project, she got sued by Laguna Beach because she had made kelp, and it was stinky and uh, full of flies and on the beach where there was never kelp before. And they oh. wanted her to to clean it up. <laughs> So, okay. yeah. so you see what the problem is, right? Like, don't let the kelp die. <laughs> like, people will forget, yeah. and then when you bring it back, they'll sue you for it, right? So, yeah. so um, that's the lesson learned from that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not a good option. <laughs> not a good option. And then it's not like the, the kelp that will grow best here is already here, right? That's if you right. put yeah. kelp twenty years, twenty miles away, and you bring it here, well, that that was in a different set of conditions, you know. Maybe it's warmer right. there or whatever, you you know uh -huh. you. You want the kelp that, that has a history of living here to be here. <laughs> That's Makes the best sense. chance. Yeah. You don't want, yeah. want a genetic bottleneck, you know. They had that in Palos Verdes yeah. where they, they they reduced it so much and then they were like, Why does all the kelp only have three stipes on it? You know? Huh. Like that yeah. was the, that was a problem because it was genetic bottleneck, right? Yeah. So yeah. Makes That's sense. Yeah. A cautionary tale of this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Not a question, just one quick suggestion. You might want to wake for uh, for safety purposes. It's a good idea to, at least I thought, to have a marker buoy up when you're swimming or scootering on the surface, just because there is like kayak and small boat traffic around there and you're not very yeah. visible. Yeah, I think that's what, what you guys were doing. Coming back, you had an SMB and the fire boat was being stupid out there. Yeah, it's don't trust anybody, you know have an smb if you're going along um I, I have a hard time pulling an smb through kelp would be the only thing but right now it's kind of not a lot of kelp so it might be easier <laughs> yeah <laughs> just, just when you're like get going on the surface like not really going yeah. through the forest but just kind of transiting back and forth yeah yeah what i was doing was actually i had a, like a crab pot buoy and i would tow it behind myself right so it makes me be like i'm like 50 feet long <laughs> right i'm just I'm, a, I'm in the water this whole thing here <laughs> yeah make yourself as visible as possible good idea uh so how so there was this one slide where you showed how far does it take to uh swim from the beach it was 1300 feet uh how long does it take for uh a recreational diver to swim on surface like what is a typical medium speed yeah is it like, that's uh, 10 or 15 yeah, minutes that's, that's about 15 minutes yeah, 15 minutes out. Okay. yeah about 15 minutes on the surface to do that you know um in all of our registration we asked people how they intend to get there and 90 percent of the people said they wanted to do it to do it 